Uh, just for information for those, I think everyone here does the lab. Remember, next week there is no lab. Okay, so Monday's a holiday, and section two, those in section two on Wednesday, we've cancelled that as well because Monday we cannot have the lab. And the following week there's no lab because also we have holidays. Okay, Songkran. Next Monday, what's the holiday? No. What's the holiday next Monday? No, something else? It's my birthday. Okay. So next Monday, and that's why every year there's a holiday on the 6th of April, it's my birthday. So thank you, enjoy. Not yet, I'm not, not my birthday yet. What's the chance that someone has the same birthday as me on the 6th of April? How would you calculate that? The, the probability that someone has the same birthday on the same date as me. Not the year in this class, unlikely you have on the same year as me, but the same day in the <laughs> day and month. What's the pro probability of that? It's interesting to know because it's related to hash collisions. So we'll look at, we'll look at that case of the chance that someone has the probability, or the probability that someone has the same birthday, the same date as me or as anyone, and then we'll see how that relates to hashes and hash collisions. How would you calculate it? And let's assume that, okay, uh, Birthdays are effectively, effectively random amongst a large group of people. That is, let's ignore leap years. Okay, there are 365 days in the year. Ignore twins and all those things. So if you think of someone's birthday, think that it, it appears on some, some random day in the year. Let's say there's one other person. What's the chance that that one other person has the same birthday as me? How would you calculate that probability? without knowing that person. One way to look at it is look at the chance that they don't have, uh, yeah, the, to find out the chance that they do have the same birthday as me, look at the chance that they don't have the same birthday as me. So, and there's no need to write this down, but just look at the concepts. That is, I have my birthday on one day in the year. If we have one other person, so if we have a, let's say a, a group of two people, two people, one person, me, have a birthday on one day in the year, then that other person, what's the probability that they don't have the same birthday as me? I'll say don't have same as me, just for short. The probability that they don't have the same birthday as me well, they can have their birthday on any 365 days in the year. Let's say we choose randomly. Mine is one of those 365, so if theirs is on any of the 364 others, then that's not the same as me. So the probability that they don't have the same birthday as me, there are 365 days to choose from. And if their birthday lands on any of those 364 other days, then they won't have the same birthday as me. So that's a quite high probability. There's only one out of 365 days which is the same as mine. That's if there's just two people in the group, me and someone else. So the probability that they do have the same birthday as me, P for probability, just be quick, do have the same as me, is what? One minus this. Okay. So the probability that other person doesn't have the, that does have the same birthday as me is one minus three hundred and sixty four out of three hundred and sixty five, whatever that number is, zero uh, zero point nine nine something. What if there are three people in the group, me and two others? What's the probability that no one 
or probability that one person has the same birthday as me. And we'll do the same way. Let's look at the probability that no one has the same birthday as me. Let's say we have a group of three people. And we want to find the... We'll go straight to what's the probability that no one has the same birthday as me, as one of those three. How we calculate that? It requires both of them not to have a birthday on my birthday. Probability that one person doesn't have the birthday on the same day as me, we know is 364 out of 365. And the probability of the other one is also they can have 364 days to choose from out of 365. So we multiply those probabilities for the probability that two people don't have the same birthday as me. The first person, they can choose from, or their birthdays can come from any 364 days and it won't be the same as me. And the second person also 364 days and it won't be the same as me. So that's the probability that no one will have the same birthday as me. And from that, the probability that so someone has the same birthday as me is 1 minus that. This is that no one does, and someone, don't care which one, one of those other two, one minus, and we see 364 over 365 to the power of 2 squared. So we could calculate, given a group of people, What's the probability that someone has the same birthday of that group, anyone in that group has the same birthday as me, as one of those people? And we can do it from this perspective of, okay, you look at the chance that no one has the same birthday as me. That is, the first person, their birthday falls on one of the other 364 days, and the second person falls on one of those other 364 days. And they have the probabilities of them multiply together and you get the chance that no one does and the probability that one of them does is one minus that. And if there were more people in the group, four, me and three others, and it would be similar, it would be the probability that those three fall on 364, so it will become 1 minus 3 to the power of 364 on 365 to the power of 3. Okay. And if it was another person to the power of 4 and so on. So the chance that any one of you in a group of our 30 students here, any one of you have the same birth date as, as me is we could calculate as 1 minus 364 out of 365 to the power of 30 people. Okay. So we can calculate that. We'll see why it's important in a moment. The, this is the, the chance that anyone has the same birthday as me. Another question is, what's the chance that any two people in this room have the same birthday? It's slightly different. Not the same birthday as me, but any pair of people have the same birthday. I don't care which day, but there is a match or a collision in birthdays. How would you calculate that? So this could be extended to cover n. We will not write it down. I'll show you another formula shortly. But let's do a different problem. Probability that any two people have same birthday. 
That's what we want to know. Again, in this case, don't worry about my birthday, but in a group of students here, what's the chance? There's just some of you, one pair of you, have the same birthday. Does anyone know they have the same birthday as someone else? Maybe. Yes, you do? Okay. We'll see what that probability is, all right? Uh, if we choose random groups, we'll see how we can calculate that probability. Does anyone have the same birthday as me? <laughs> okay, that probability we'll see is much lower. Of a group of 30, the chance that one of you have the same as me is quite low, in fact. We would plug in 1 to the power of 364. Actually, we can do it. Let's say instead of 2 here, we have 30 here. What is that probability? 364 divided by 365 to the power of 30. Is that 1 minus 8%? So there's an 8% chance if we have 30 people that you, one of those people have the same birthday as me. Or as any person, if we, it doesn't have to be as me as one of the others. So now we're trying something different. The probability that any two people in this group have the same birthday. And we can approach the problem by a similar manner. Look at the probability that no two people have the same birthday. That's the opposite. What's the probability that no two people have the same birthday? Well, let's try it with a couple of cases. Uh, the, the second one. Let's say that there are, again, two people in the group. Just two people. We want to look at the probability that no two people have the same birthday. So, again, we can think of it. I have my birthday on one day. What's the probability the other one doesn't have on my birthday? It's also, we've got 364 days to choose from. Out of 364 days would not be the same as mine. That is, let's say... Mine is on one day, the other person, the other one person, there's 364 days out of 365 that don't clash with mine, that don't cause a collision. So in this case, the probability that no one in a group of two have the same, let's call this... Uh, be no. Is simply and this P any, then P any is one minus this. This is the same as before. Well, let's say a, a more comp or a different case. Three people in the group. There are three people. We want to know, what's the chance that any pair have the same birthday? Not the same as mine, but just any one of us have the same birthday as one of the others. Well, I think there are three people now. We would look at the, the probability that no two people have the same birthday. For example, if my birthday is on one day, and there are two other people. What's the chance that this one doesn't have the birthday on the same as me? There's 364 days to choose from. What's the chance that this one doesn't have the same birthday as me or the other one? How many days remaining? So 
this is on one day, this is on another day, the probability is this, so on a third day then there are 363 days remaining. So the probability is we multiply these two together and we get the probability of no one is 364 on 365 times 363 on 365. Slightly different from before. In the case that we said the same birthday as Steve, as a particular person, the probability that no one had the same birthday as me was 364, the first person had, could be any of those 364 days, and the second person could be any of those 364 days. It didn't matter if those two people clashed. That's not what we're asking. We're asking that those two people did not have the same birthday as me, not as e each other. But now we're asking, make sure that no two people have the same birthday of that set of three. Well, they cannot have the same as me or the other one. And it becomes this. If there are four people in the group, how would you calculate it? The probability that no one has the same birthday. similar concept. The probability is the other one doesn't have the same as me. There are 364 days to choose from. The other two, there are 363 days that will not collide with either of those two. And other three, there are 362 days will not collide with either of those three. And we multiply them together and that will give you the probability. We, we said we're ignoring leap years. I'll leave as a homework to calculate with leap years. <laughs> no. We'll see that we're not ca caring about birthdays, we're going to care about hash collisions and there are no leap years involved there. So in this case the probability that no one would be 364 out of 365 363 out of 365 times 362 out of 365. And we could extend that for n. It's what? There's some factorial involved, correct? At the top, the numerator is 364 down to 362. So that's some portion of a factorial and the, the denominator is the 364 uh, related to the power of n minus 1 in this case. So we could, ex we could find, find a formula that would express that for any value of n. Okay. And what we wanted though was the probability that any person, any two people have the same birthday, it's 1 minus all of this. The probability that any two people have the same birthday is 1 minus probability that no two people have the same birthday. And you can find a formula for that, which I'm not going to write down because it's on one of the handouts you have. I think you have it. If not, uh, just scroll forward a few pages. Do you? Yes, title authentication. And if you scroll down a bit, you'll see that there's some discussion of this. This is called the birthday paradox or the birthday problem. And in a short moment, we'll relate it to hash collisions. You can read through, but we look at the first one we looked at is what's the probability that someone has the same birthday as Steve, as X in general? That was the first thing. And we can look at it from the perspective of the probability that someone has the same birthday as me is 1 minus the probability that no one has the same birthday as me. And you can, we looked at if there's a group of two people, then it's just 364 out of 365. If there's three people, it's 364 out of 365 squared. And with n people, we can generalize to n and 
one minus that for the probability that someone has the same birthday as me. That was one problem. Then the second one we think about is, well, what's the chance of that group of people, any two people have the same birthday, which we just went through, and we worked out the probability that no two people have the same birthday, and we went through, and you can generalise that, and this generalises it in terms of factorials, and it comes out as this equation. The probability that any two people have the same birthday is the one at the top, where we have 365 days to choose from and a group of n people. So, why do we care? We'll see that there's something about collisions of birthdays. In one case, it's given someone's birthday, mine, what's the chance that someone else collides with mine? That was the first problem. The second problem was, given a group of people, what's the chance that any two people collide? And we're trying to compare, well, what's the difference in terms of the probabilities? So it depends upon n, the size of the group. And this plot shows those probabilities. The blue one is... Sorry, the red one is the first case. That is, the probability that sa someone has the same birthday as me, the probability is the red line. The blue one is the probability that any two people in the group have the same birthday. And the group size on, on the horizontal axis, n here. For example, the way to read this, 30 people in the class, so n is 30. The probability that someone has the same birthday as me is here. It's what, about 8%, close to 0 0.1. So we say the probability that same, someone in this group, in this class, has the same as me is about 8%, close to 10%. But of this group of people, this 30 people, the probability that any two of you have the same birthday is up here, wherever it is, 65%. There's a much higher chance that a pair will have a collision of birthdays. And in fact, we have at least one pair here that we know of in this group of people. If you choose another group of people and look at the average, then you'll see that the average probability hits this calculated value. So, which one's more likely? Same birthday as me, or any two people have the same birthday? First or second? The second case is more likely with the same size group, the same set of, uh, the same value of n. Much more likely as n goes up. Or another perspective, what's the probability, or what's the size of the group such that the probability is greater than 50%? How many people do we need in the group such that the chance that any two people have the same birthday is more than 50%? That is, if I had to bet yes or no, more than 50%, I would bet yes. What's the size of the group? On the blue line, 50% comes out about here. It's around 23 people, if you can work out. Given a group of 23 people, there's about a 50% chance that any two of them will have the same birthday. But if you select one of those people from that group, me for example, the chance that one of the others will have the same birthday as me is only around uh, 6 or 7%, much, much lower. So this is about collisions of birthdays. And the blue one is sometimes not so obvious. People don't think that. That, it, that probability is quite high. It's a very high chance that in our group that we'll have someone with the same birthday. And this logic is used in analysing the chance of hash collisions. Because with hash collisions, remember with a hash function, we take some message and we produce some hash value, and it's a random mapping. In the same way, assume we, our birthdays are on random days in the year, then we care about the probability that messages will produce the same hash value, will collide on the hash value. And we 
last lecture, we talked about weak collision resistance and strong collision resistance. And weak collision resistance was that given some message, it's hard to find some other message that produces the same hash value. Strong collision resistance is the attacker is allowed to choose any pair of messages to find a collision. If you're given some message, given some birthday, finding the, the probability of finding a collision is quite low, the red line, for the same group size. But if you have the freedom to choose any two inputs, any two people, any two messages, then the probability of getting a collision is much higher. So from the attacker's perspective, the chance of them finding a collision is much higher if they can have the freedom to choose from any two messages than if they have to take one given message and then search for another message that will produce the same hash value. From the attacker's perspective, attacking the strong collision resistance property is easier. Questions? There's a, a lot of logic involved there, and I'm not expecting everyone to follow everything, but this concept of collisions amongst birthdays and collisions amongst hashes is the same. And we're trying to compare weak and strong collision resistance. With birthdays, it was n out of 365. So we had the parameters n and 365 days. It's with hash values, what do we have? We have the parameters of the, the hash size, the number of bits in the hash. That is, if we have a 128-bit hash value, there are 2 to the power of 128 possible hash values. So a collision is when two messages produce the same hash value. So we, what we want to look at is what's the chance that, or how many messages do we need to try until we produce the same hash value? So uh, if we want to compare to the birthday problem, instead of 365, it's the hash length. Say 2 to the power of 128. And n is how many messages do we need to try until, say, we get a 50% chance of a collision. That's the way we would map it to the... the hash collision problem. So people asked me last week, well, is it really much difference? Well, there's a significant difference. It's much easier to find of a group any two people with the same birthday than it is to find someone with the same birthday as me. And the same with hashes. Everyone can answer an exam question on proving which one's easier. Don't worry too much. That's not the point. Just be aware that how strong and weak collision resistance are related. What's the difference between them and which one's easier from the attacker's perspective? If you want to check those calculations, you can read through there. Uh, and there are many uh, uh, websites or books that will explain it in even more depth. So coming back to hashes, back to our requirements for hash functions. This is what we want of hash functions. There's some practical requirements and security requirements. By security requirements, I mean they should have those properties if we want to use them for a particular security purpose, for data authentication or, or uh, digital signatures, for example. Depending upon how we use the hash function, some requirements may or may not be needed. We'll list some shortly. But just recapping, hash function takes a variable size input, produces a fixed, usually small length, uh, small output. Should be easy to calculate, so applying the hash function on the input should be easy, that is fast. And then we have the output should be random, hash of um, many different messages should not all produce similar hash values. 
If the messages are similar, the hash values shouldn't be similar. They should be random output. And the three security properties here, and they've got different names, that is, think of two different names each. The one-way property is saying that if I give you the hash value, it's hard to find the message. It would take too long to find it. It's also called pre-image resistant. I will tend to use the, the names in, in, in brackets here because I, I find them easier to say and easier to relate to what the property is. The second property, weak collision resistant. We'd like a hash function to be weak collision resistant. That is, it should be hard if, I, if the attacker has some message X, should be hard for them to find some other message that produces a collision. That's, it should be hard for them, that's the, the first case of the birthday problem, that is hard to find someone who has the same birthday as me. That probability should be low. And the way that we make that probability low is make the hash size large. And the probability is very, very low. Since the probability is low compared to the second one, it's, it's harder for the attacker to find that. And then strong collision resistance, or simply collision resistant, is that if the attacker is allowed to choose any pair of messages, X and Y, any pair that they like, it should be hard for them to find a pair that produce the same hash value. Hard to produce a collision. That's strong collision resistant. And that is easier for the attacker to do compared to weak collision resistant attacks. Because they have more freedom to choose those messages and there's a higher probability that they can find a collision. So sometimes we will compare hash functions in terms of strength and we'll compare based upon how hard it is uh, of each of these uh, properties to be achieved. And it generally relates, as long as the hash algorithm has no weakness or no known weakness in the algorithm, it depends upon the length of the hash value, how many bits in the hash value. And I thought I had uh, some numbers here. Yeah, this slide. That is pre-image resistant or one-way property and weak collision resistant are about the same in performing a brute force attack. That is, they take about the same amount of effort for the attacker. Whereas the strong collision resistant to attack that property takes less effort for the attacker, given the same hash algorithm. And that's captured on this slide. The first two properties, which were pre-image and second pre-image attacks or the attack on the one-way property or the attack on the weak collision resistant property. Basically the attack involves the same thing from the, the attacker's perspective. You, you need to find a message Y that gives a specific hash value. And how to do that, you can start to try all possible values or random values of Y until you get the right hash value. And the effort required is related if we have an m bit hash value, say 128 bit hash value as output, then the effort required is proportional to 2 to the power of m, the number of hash values possible. So if there's 128 bit hash value, 2 to the power of 128 possible hash values, then the effort required, the number of messages that the attacker must try, is about 2 to the power of 128. That is, it needs to apply the hash algorithm 2 to the power of 128 times, which, as long as the hash algorithm is, uh, uh, most hash algorithms are not fast to compute, which would take forever for most cases. So to defeat the first two properties, it's equivalent to 2 to the power of m, where m is the length of the hash. But a brute force attack on the strong collision resistant property, they have the freedom of searching for any two messages that produce the hash, same hash value. And if you look at those equations for the birthday problem or the birthday paradox, you can approximate them to see that to get a collision, it's on the order of 2 to the power of m divided by 2. That is, if m is 128, 
128-bit hash value, to defeat the first two properties, attack them, it would take 2 to the power of 128 operations. But to defeat the strong collision resistance property, it would take just 2 to the power of 64 operations. Much, much faster to attack. That is easier for the attacker, more chance for them to get the solution, to find uh, the two messages. So that leads to the requirements on the hash lengths. If we want a hash algorithm that is, is not subject to all of these brute force attacks, that is, it's not subject to the strong collision resistance attack, the weak collision resistance attack, or the one-way property attack, then we need to choose a value of m, the hash length, such that 2 to the power of m divided by 2 will be too many operations to try in a reasonable time. Maybe it's in the order of 100 or 80 or more. That is, the hash value of 256 leads to 2 to the power of 128 in this case. And that's considered, if you, if you do 2 to the power of 128 operations, it would take too long to calculate. But in some cases, we don't need the strong collision resistance property. It's not needed for all security operations. So in the cases where we only need the first two properties, we need just a hash value such that it, the length is such that a brute force attack on those first two properties is not possible. So it depends on how we use the hash algorithm as to whether it's secure for, for uh, its purpose. And we'll compare in, in the next few slides the two main hash algorithms, JAR and MD5. But here, there are some other attacks. These are brute force attacks. There are other attacks that take advantage of the algorithm design. And they are, some are possible in theory, but generally very, very complex. And it's probably just as much, just as easy to do a brute force attack than apply the crypto analysis in many hash algorithms. So, if we want to defeat these brute force attacks, we need a hash value long enough. MD5 uses 128 bits. That becomes here 2 to the power of 64. And to do 2 to the power of 64 operations is possible. So a brute force attack on strong collision resistance prop property is possible against MD5. And in fact, people have come up with even better attacks that bring it down to about 2 to the power of 60, 16 times faster than a brute force. So SHA, the secure hash algorithm, uses longer codes, more bits. And it makes the collision attacks not possible. So let's talk about SHA just briefly, MD5 and SHA, just to give the parameters. MD5, message digest algorithm number five, developed by Ron Rivest, who, RSA. RSA, the R in RSA. Okay, he, he developed a number of other cryptographic algorithms. MD5, RC4 is a stream, uh, symmetric stream cipher, developed by the same guy. I think all three of them may be considered geniuses. That, that it's not just him that's, that's done other things. If you look at the history of the other two, Shamir and Edelman, they've also done a lot as well. But yet, yeah, Ron Rivest has created many different algorithms used for different purposes in security. MD5 produces a 128-bit hash value. Uh, it's still, it is still widely used. You'll still you see it used in, in different applications. Uh, in password files in some cases, that is the storage of passwords. Is passwords are not stored in the clear on your computer. They're stored usually in, as a hash of a password. Or if you develop a website and you need to store the user's passwords, you don't store them in the database in the clear. You should apply some algorithm. Usually you take a hash of the password with some random number and store that value. And MD5 is still used by some people, but it's considered insecure for most purposes. It's no longer recommended to be used. 
there are some known attacks against it that make it possible to defeat MD5. So the secure hash algorithm was developed uh, and it's gone through different versions. There's SHA-0, SHA-1, SHA-2, SHA-3. And generally SHA-2 and 3 are considered secure, 0 and 1 not. There are some known attacks against them. So SHA-2 is commonly used, SHA-1 also still used. SHA-3 is quite new, so it's not so widely used at the moment. Actually, it's not still in development. The competition was run and someone won the competition and, and uh, it is actually a standard now. SHA-1 in this table, the message digest size is the hash size. The other rows in the table are not so important. The, the parameters of the algorithm, the way that it calculates, but the hash size, SHA-1, 160 bits, SHA-2, Actually, you can choose the hash length, 224, 256, 384, and 512. You can have different hash lengths with SHA-2. So uh, you often, I think, see SHA-256 used. And that's considered strong collision resistant. With 256 bits in the hash value, that needs 102 to the power of 128 operations to defeat the strong collision resistance property in a brute force attack. There are other hash algorithms, but MD5 and SHA are the main ones that we'll see around. And just coming back, I think we skipped over one slide and we're almost done. Hash algorithms are used in different uh, security mechanisms. And depending upon the mechanism that they use for, the requirements of those three properties differ. So the three properties, pre-image resistant is the one-way property, second pre-image resistant is the weak collision resistant property, and collision resistant is the strong collision resistant property. So if we use the hash algorithm for a digital signature, we would generally like that hash algorithm to have, to be res have all those three properties. We'd like to have all those three properties. The, this one is under certain conditions, but we generally like an algorithm such that an attacker cannot do a brute force attack against any of those three properties. But hash algorithms are used for other security purposes. Sometimes they're used for uh, intrusion or virus detection. So your antivirus software uses hashes to compare files and do checks. They can be used with symmetric key encryption. We saw some examples where we combined the hash of the message and then we encrypted it using a symmetric key cipher and a shared secret key. With that case, those three properties are not important. Okay, so the properties, the requirements differ depending on how we use the hash algorithm. So MD5 could be used here and it would be okay. They're used to store passwords and you should be aware of that if you develop web applications especially. You store someone's password in a database, you take a hash of the password and store the hash value in the database. Or even better, you take a hash of the password combined with a random number, a salt, and store that in the database. So a password file or a password database stores the hash value. For that to work, the one-way property should hold. It should be hard for someone to take the hash value and find the original password. The other two properties are not so important for that application. And for message authentication codes, we can convert a hash algorithm into a message authentication co code quite easily. And a way to do that is called HMAC. And for that, again, the three properties are required. So we sometimes would say a hash function is weak if it satisfies these two properties plus the others. It is a strong hash function if it satisfies all three security properties plus the other uh, practical properties. So people compare those hash functions based upon the properties it satisfies.
How do we go? Did we get to the end? Any questions? All right. Uh, we, we haven't looked at how the algorithms work. What does MD5 do to calculate the hash? Uh, and same with SHA. What these um, SHA does is, so what have we got? Message digest size is the hash output. The message size, the input, is limited. It must be less than this size. So we say any size input, well, there is an upper limit. But you see these upper limits are quite high. Your message must be less than 2 to the power of 64 bits, which is very long. The block size, they, they operate on sort of in rounds in the similar to our block ciphers. We apply some algorithm and then repeat it and repeat it and repeat it. So in each case, they operate. If we have a long message, first that message is split into blocks. So the block size specifies how long, 512 bits, for example. Uh, word, I think that is again split up into words or smaller blocks. And it's repeated multiple times. And the number of steps is like the number of rounds, the same concept in, in DES and others. The number of times we repeat that algorithm to produce the output. Is there a simplified SHA for you to study? Uh, I, th I think the algorithms are not, not so complex that you can understand them. MD5, is uh, you can actually study it and see how it works. It won't take long. But I don't have it here, and I haven't looked at it for, for a long, long time. So go and study MD5 and SHA. And other hash algorithms as well. Any other questions to finish up? on cryptographic hash functions. I'm just going backwards, see if I've missed some things. So we've looked today, really summarized about the requirements. So you'll see in your quiz, there are some questions about those three security properties, especially. Be aware of what the difference between them is. You don't need to prove why one's easier than the other, but you should be aware that attacking the strong collision resistant property is easier than attacking the weak collision resistant property. And it's nice to understand why. Any questions before we move on?